My name is Alberto Ayala. I'm the Air Pollution Control Officer and Director of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. Great, great. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, Eric Guerra, uh, Council Member for the City of Sacramento, but I serve as the Chair of the uh, Sac Metro Air District, which is a, a combination of a number of cities and the county uh, that encompasses the Air District. Excellent. Alberto, Eric, welcome. It's so good to talk to you and have you here uh, on our PSA show here in Bonneville. I uh, wanted to ask first, Eric, what is the principal job of the SAC Metro Air District? Well, I think it's as uh, simple as you hear it. You know, it's maintaining good air quality for the region. I mean, obviously, we have a mandate from both the federal government and the state government uh, to uh, keep our both uh, air quality levels as far as ozone and particulate matter to a healthy level, that ma making sure that we comply with the Clean Air Act. Uh, and so that gives us a number of authorities uh, to uh, to control the emissions that are coming out of uh, uh, out of whatever entity in the region. Uh, but it also gives us an, an ability to provide incentives through either federal dollars and state dollars and some a little bit of local dollars. Uh, to try to create new ideas and ways to address our air quality. Obviously, climate change is an issue that is affecting our entire uh, you know, world, but uh, air quality as well is something that is having a day-to-day -day impact on the health of uh, folks in our community. And if I can uh, quickly add to that, um, you know, it's interesting, um, air districts uh, were actually the very first agencies, government entities uh, in the United States and in, that, in the world for that matter, uh, that were created with the charge of uh, ensuring air quality in, in regions. So air districts date back to the very beginning of uh, the air quality and environmental movement. And of course, uh, fast forward uh, 70 years now, uh, you've got, as, as Council Member Guerra mentioned, uh, you've got uh, agencies that are principally charged with making sure that we have uh, air quality, which is a legally binding requirement. And then, of course, these days, uh, given that we are in California, is also executing on some of the state's uh, uh, climate goals. And Alberto and Eric, I'd love to get your uh, your opinion on this as well. It's easy for us all to take our air quality and just air outside for granted. It's around us all the time. Uh, but how important is it for us to not only pay attention to it, but do our part to help keep it clean and, and do what we can to make sure it's good for everybody? Well, I think the, the important thing is that air air doesn't stay, uh, good air and bad air doesn't stay within a political boundary. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all are impacted, regardless of, of uh, your uh, geography, political uh, uh, affiliation, uh, and, uh, and we know that what happens in one area can aff affect another community too. So for us, it's the it's the fact that this is a uh, a unifying issue that um, that we have to work together to address one one entity alone or one group of, of of folks in our community trying to address the air quality issue isn't going to make any change. And the last thing is, you know, if anybody's ever held their breath underwater, without good air, you know, you just can't live. I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, we do a lot, and I think the public uh, pays a lot of attention to water quality. But we do take a lot of, uh, uh, I think, sometimes for granted uh, until we have major fires where people can't breathe outside and their eyes are hurting and, uh, or family members who have respiratory illnesses when, when people see the dramatic impact that air quality has on a person's health and on a community. Yeah, I just, I just want to echo some of that because it really is a very fundamental concept of protection of public health. Because, uh, as, as we all know, uh, air pollution kills you. And uh, to your point, I think we do take it for granted, thanks, I think, uh, to the great progress that we've, we've made. And, you know, it hasn't been easy and it hasn't been quick. I mean, this is, this is 50, 60, 60 years in the making. Uh, but the reason our quality is important, again, and, and it matters to everybody, because it boils down to just the fundamental principle of public health. Uh, around the world, in other parts that are not as lucky as we are uh, enjoying uh, the cleaner air that we do have, uh, you know, they're suffering and, and they are um, uh, experiencing uh, ailments uh, and premature death. So, I mean, it, it really is as basic as 
you know, it's a fundamental necessity for for living uh, for us humans and others that, that rely on, on on clean air. And gentlemen, when we pay attention to air quality, typically it's when something major is going on, like fire season in California, and there's a lot of smoke uh, in, in Sacramento or in Northern California. And of course, we dealt with that earlier this year. But we should all be paying attention to air quality all the time, right? Even when there's not some significant oh. disaster going on. Oh, of course. And, and I, I would use the analogy uh, of, you know, the, that uh, a frog in, in slow uh, boiling water doesn't know that they're boiling. I mean, people have heard that before. But, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is the day impacts are affecting us. And particularly in communities, uh, I think we're talking, there's a lot of conversation right now about how do we uh, provide equity and, uh, and uh, environmental justice to those low-income communities, many who live near freeways or areas where congestion is happening. That, that overall uh, accumul- accumulative effect on, on those communities uh, has also a disproportionate effect on how, um, how they are uh, affected. When you complicate that with the lack of access sometimes uh, to health care, uh, we are actually creating more harm to some communities, but everybody is being affected by that because of, of the daily impacts of, of, of pollution. Uh, I, I, I think for those that are in the, in the generations during smog days probably can, uh, can remember um, schools closing down. And I, I uh, can recall when I would visit my family in Mexico City, uh, you know, just getting off the airplane and out of the airport, uh, not you, you could feel the pressure and the pain uh, in your eyes and, and the impacts, the health impacts that happen. So to Dr. Yala's point, um, you, you know, uh, it, we are fortunate here that we're doing better. But if we don't keep an eye on this on a daily basis, it's that slow churn that is affecting our health every single day. And, and the fact of the matter is, as, as council members suggested, and, and, you know, the wildfires is an interesting example, right, because the pollution is so evident. But the fact of the matter is most of the pollution that concerns us, some of the most toxic compounds that, that uh, you know, that we are trying to, to mitigate uh, cannot be seen. And in many cases, um, you may not necessarily even be able to smell them. So I think that's the reason that we need to be vigilant that, um you know, again, thankfully, you look at the window and, and you know, it may look like clean air, but, uh, you know, measurement and data is, is really where it's at. And that is precisely some of the key functions that uh, air agencies like air districts uh, play. And to that yeah, point, in fact, to that point, I mean, the technology has been advanced much on uh, air, air measurements and, and individual families can also purchase uh, the, the, like the purple air, meter, uh, air meters. But as the air district, we're also creating different places and mobile testing units so that we can look at some of those particulates, some of those chemical, uh, uh, that are chemical impacts that are, uh, that are in elements that are in the air so that we can start identifying which communities and which areas have higher toxins, where they're coming from, we know, though, uh, one of the, the clear things is that every one of us is probably contributing to that poor air if we own a, um, a, a vehicle that has gasoline. So every day we're out driving, we're contributing to that, that effect. Um, and even congestion with an electric vehicle that it creates congestion in the area is part of that effort. So that's, I think, why it's important for us to keep track of this on a daily basis. And, and just a really small point, I'm going to step in and, and put in a disclaimer for our, our board chair. Um, Purple Air is just one of many technologies, so we are not officially endorsing any given no, that's manufacturer <laughs> of sensors. <laughs> <Same one. laughs> it's, it's shorthand. Uh, but, um, you know, to that point, I mean, we do benefit that technology has come a long way and information is going to become only more and more readily accessible so that people can make decisions uh, that, that best meets their, their health uh, needs. Could you guys provide an update on our air quality currently in Sacramento? Yeah, our, our, our controller here has the, the latest information. In fact, uh, we, we can also do projections um, of what we expect it to be. Uh, is that correct, Alberto? <laughs> that's correct. And uh, that's pretty good. He's putting us on the spot. So I'm going to tell you right now, um, downtown Sacramento is sitting uh, on the moderate side, a yellow uh, color for the air quality index uh, in terms of particle pollution. 
and things are looking better uh, on the ozone side of pollution. <laughs> I don't know if that was the, the key to your question, but again, um, this is just to say that um, the tools are out there, the networks are, are out there, and there are people like us that are constantly tracking this information. And again, we rely on folks like, like you uh, to get the information out, particularly during events like the wildfires when it's really critical that people have the latest. Now, interestingly, this time of year, uh, for those who've lived in the Sacramento region, uh, this would be a very terrible type of year for particulates, uh, mostly because of wood stoves. Uh, we also used to burn uh, rice fields as well. So, uh, you know, the the uh, um, the quality of air actually today, uh, now we're in the a moderate, on the border of unhealthy for sensitive groups just today, Um uh, but uh, because of the efforts we've done to encourage the, the transition to uh, inserts for um, electric or gas uh, uh, wood stoves and fireplaces, uh, the spare the air efforts have dramatically changed the air quality in the region where a day, on a day like this, maybe 15 years ago, would be terrible air to be outside. And another related point to that is um, – you know, these days that we are spending a lot of time uh, indoors and in mostly homes, um, I think a good thing to, to remind your listeners about is, um, you know, combustion is combustion. And anything, any time that you burn uh, a fossil fuel of any type is probably going to result in, in products of combustion that are not good for you. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically referring now that, you know, even something as, as clean as a natural gas the stove or things of that nature. I mean, when you're burning in an indoor environment, you know, that is pollution that eventually and hopefully sooner rather than later, we would like to see, um, you know, mitigated because it does lead to exposure to contaminants that, that are not going to uh, be good for us. So I think it's just a general sense of uh, anytime you have combustion, whether it's a wildfire or any other source, just we need to be very mindful that uh, that is something that we don't want to be exposed to. What are the biggest sources of air pollution in the Sacramento region specifically? Well, I think by far, not just Sacramento region, but I, in, in most cities, it's mobile sources. And what we mean by that is uh, cars, trucks, uh, vehicle traffic. I mean, that we, we do have issues in any manufacturing area from um, any kind of processing plant or uh, power plant. But the biggest uh, issue that we have to really get a hold of is our, our, our own transportation issues. Um, you know, Alberto, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the, per- you know, the the percentages and the the, gra- the how the difference in impacts. Absolutely, and and you know that's a that's a an excellent point. I mean, anywhere between, depending on which pollutant you're looking at. I mean, we're looking at anywhere between fifty and seventy seventy five percent of all pollution is cars and trucks and, and buses and everything that is that is using fossil fuels uh, to to for propulsion. Um, and, and, and the reason is is really not that on a per vehicle basis they are necessarily dirty. It's just that there are so many of, of them. And you know, if you if if we can think back at, at the world pre COVID, there's a lot of driving that is that is going on. I mean, this is a big estate with a lot of people. So that's the re- one of the reasons that that pollution from mobile sources is is the greatest uh, uh, impact. The other point is again that the other sectors have gotten cleaner and cleaner. Uh, over time much faster. I mean, if you think of the industrial sector, if you think of, you know, big sources like power plants and other things like that, it's not that they don't create pollution. They obviously do, but the relative contribution is not as great as, as, as you know, the, the 26 million cars driving around in, in, in California and probably close to 2 million of the heavier vehicles. The Biden... Yeah, Harry- I think- oh, sorry, go for it. Oh, no, I was going to say, and I think, you know, the one of the interesting things that uh, the Air District is responsible for, and this, one, this it comes to the issue of our regional economy, we're required to make sure we meet the federal air quality uh, attainment goals uh, that are set by the Clean Air Act at the federal level. Um, and when we can't make those goals, uh, meet those, those standards, we have to find the immediate way to, to, uh, to achieve them, which could be say, shutting down an industrial facility or stopping construction or, or whatever effort's going to help us bring down those, uh, those pollutants to a safe level. 
Well, if we can't manage the mobile source traffic, which is you and I driving around, then that could impact uh, by mandate at the federal level our our business activity as well. So this goes uh, with us working with our businesses to make sure we're working um, to find a, these goals because they see the the need to have cleaner air so that we can all uh, function uh, collectively. The Biden-Harris administration, they've identified climate change as one of their four day one priorities. What does that mean for California and the Sacramento region? I have to imagine that's a good thing. Uh, I, I, oh, oh, go oh, yeah, ahead. no, go ahead, Alberto. I think it's a great thing. I think you, I, yeah. I saw your excitement uh, when you saw that. So I'll let you start off there. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I mean, absolutely. Right. Because, I mean, if we can, you know, without getting in, in, in too much into into the politics of it. But if, if we look back at the last four years of the current EPA, uh, they've been on a, a rolling back uh, of environmental protections mode. Uh, so for those of us that work in this space, uh, the fact that climate change is no longer a dirty word, the fact that climate change is really based, based on science that tells us that this is not a good thing for the planet and the humans that live on it, I think all of us are taking that as a, as a great sign that hopefully will lead to acceleration and expansion of what we have already been working on and many of the things that we talked about earlier. Exactly. And I, and I think one of the things, particularly in California, but I'm sure with the United States in general, innovation, um, innovation has been a, a huge area for our economic strength. And so the, the, the rollbacks uh, in the previous administration created a disincentive for a lot of the new technology and innovation and opportunities, not just from a health standpoint that it, we should be doing this or or from a uh, from a climate responsibility standpoint, but you know the the I think what's inspiring about the new the new Biden Harris administration's interest in this is it's going to drive more uh, creativity and innovation in industries. Um, uh, the only thing I would say is I hope the Biden administration, Biden Harris administration, also focus on the uh, upscaling for workers and, and uh, into these career pathways and into these new. Uh, ways that we can help achieve our our, uh, our climate and air quality goals. The city of Sacramento is currently in the process of developing a climate action plan. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. So it came about uh, by uh, the Climate Commission that our mayor and our adjacent mayors uh, uh, pulled together. Uh, Dr. Ayala was on the one of our commissioners on, on that Climate Commission. Uh, and, and it's looking at a multi-level of areas that that we can address this. So it isn't just about electrification of vehicles. It's looking at every aspect of our daily life and how can we slowly start to transition. Um, uh, I wouldn't say slowly transition, but but plan for a transition that that uh, that helps us achieve those goals. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Yo, maybe you could talk a little bit about the conversations and also the diversity on the commission that kind of influenced our city's commitment to climate change. Uh, absolutely, and you know the commission uh, did uh, a lot of uh, a lot of great things. But one of the principal uh, achievements, if I can if I can say that, is is again this diversity. It brought together the public, the private sector, the multiple agencies that are interested in in, in the topic, and really got us um, uh, to focus on you know how do we advance the region uh, into this uh, decarbonization path uh, that we're interested in, in a way that actually helps us. And, and I do want to echo what uh, Council Member Guerra uh, said about this is all about uh, taking advantage of the green future and green tech and the promise that that can bring to a region like our region. And uh, the Climate Commission identified some priority areas, uh, one of them being mobility, obviously, so uh, transportation and, and, and mobile sources. The other one was the built environment, and the other one was uh, community resilience, right? So it's thinking about how do we mitigate the sources of this pollution that we're interested in controlling, and community resilience has to do with how do we prepare for the future, which we know is going to come with some extreme impacts because we've already committed to some uh, global warming. Uh, so the 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 credit that I give the council member and his fellow council members in Sacramento is that they really have not they haven't 
they haven't shied away from from really taking on the challenge and adopting as many of the recommendations from the commission as possible into a formal uh, a commitment that is a climate action plan for a city like Sacramento. And I'm just elated that that is taking place. And certainly, as a as a representative of the Air District, you know, we remain committed and, and willing to do what we can to help. Yeah, I think that, and that's the uh, for us uh, strategically as a city in a region. We definitely want to be not just uh, you know contributors to the policy and the goals of climate change, but we, you know selfishly we want to also be the the producers of the of the technology. I mean we do produce uh, many electric trains here in the Sacramento region, and with that come the supply chain associated with it, and also many jobs that that come with it that don't require a four year degree but pay well above the minimum wage. And I, I think one of the inspiring things is that we're looking at how do we become the the mobility um, uh, champions that address the issues. We started this conversation with uh, mobi- uh, mobile sources being one of the highest pollutants. But if we could be the, the center for zero emission mobility solutions, whether it be electric vehicles, uh, for heavy-duty construction, other uh, obviously we already do train construction, but other solutions, that I think is – there's a win for our uh, our residents and our regional economy, but most importantly, for the health of uh, of our region. And that leads perfectly into my next question. I understand that Sacramento is going to be the home of the California Mobility Center. Can you tell us what that center is and, and why it's so important? Well, yeah. So the California Mobility Center will be a multi-partner uh, uh, agency with the uh, University uh, of uh, California, uh, uh, Sacramento State University, uh, our local municipal district, Sacramento Municipal Uni- Utility District, that uh, that's our power producer, uh, and uh, partners with uh, our city and private uh, uh, companies who want to get into uh, the forefront of creating new technologies to to address our mobility solutions. Uh, and and because of that, we want to be able to not just do be a, uh, a R and D facility, but actually do focus on the two market product level phase. So we want to make sure that we're ramping up any idea that we have so that can immediately get to market and provide, uh, say, if if it's completely all electric garbage trucks that every city needs. But moving in those directions, the the benefit of that is the manufacturing jobs and all of those pieces are are within the area. Those are, I think, uh, uh, unique forms of, of employment for folks. So the Mobility Center actually started by Alberto and Ayala and I Heading over to uh, uh, to Germany to look at a similar model in Aachen, Germany, uh, with uh, um, where their university partnered with private industry to find zero uh, uh, mobility solutions. Very interesting. You know, one thing that is one thing that is unique. If I can just add quickly to the California Mobility Center, and, and I don't think it's an accident that is located in Sacramento, and and the reason for that is. It really is something that be, goes beyond bricks and mortar and gizmos. Clearly, manufacturing and creating these technology solutions is is the core. But the idea is that we're also going to be uh, exploring and uh, challenging ourselves to try to figure out what are the policies, what are the rules or regulations at the state, at the local, at the national level that are needed to really create openings into these new markets, right? Because a gizmo, by the sake of, of being a gizmo, uh, doesn't necessarily lead right away into markets. I mean, policies clearly uh, have a, a very important role. I mean, if, if you think of uh, electric vehicles, right, I mean, it, it was really policies that, that led us down the path of where we are today. And I think you can extrapolate that uh, experience to any and all technologies, like the ones that the council member was pointing to that we unfortunately got to see not long ago in, 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 in Germany. So that's what's unique about this, that, that is really visionary um, by, by just the fact that it understands that it's not just let's create something and let's wait for it if it sells. It's really let's create something with a clear understanding of what it's going to take for this to really become a solution. And being in Sacramento, the state capital of California, I mean, it allows all 120 legislators and the governor and the agencies to come in and see and test firsthand. And we can be in in close proximity to the policymakers, all of the internal human capital of the staff that are making these statewide decisions. And one of the things we've noticed, uh, you know, for a long time in California's history, um, California's innovation then spreads throughout the country. And I think this is where Sacramento 
uh, can be the, the 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 leader not just for our, our region and state, but but setting that tone uh, uh, for the country uh, to address climate change. And I think it's very cool that that pattern has started with the willingness for you both to travel to Germany to learn uh, what they have done over there and then implement it here uh, in Sacramento. I'm, I'm a sucker for hearing stories of how we can learn from each other and help each other around the world. And that certainly is an example of that. But before we wrap up, for, for both of you, if you wanted to leave our audience with one major takeaway from this interview, what would it be? I'll jump in. I mean, I'll say... Um, air quality uh, is uh, fundamental uh, for our public health. And if I can leave your listeners with, with one thought is, again, um, we have made a lot of progress, but we still have a long ways to go because air quality is not at the, at the level that it needs to be to really be protective of everyone's health. And if I can just leave your listeners with that thought, uh, you know, everything that we talked about, everything that, that is going on around us, that touches on the environment, that touches on climate change, boils down to that very simple concept, that this is about protecting your health, my health, the health of our kids, and, and, and so forth. So um, with that, I, again, just want to thank you before I, I sign off, want to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to participate. Yeah, I would say with you also that it's not yeah, just stepping outside your house, you're impacted by air quality. And even inside your house, you're in, impacted by um, the air quality that you have, which is, you know, why we have carbon monoxide testers now in our own homes. And that's uh, 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 because of the issue of air quality. The most important thing is that if we don't keep air quality in the forefront, um, I think that we're not going to be able to have the future that our kids uh, would want to benefit from. And uh, keeping that in mind now is going to help us really, uh, one, not only save the future for our kids, but help us improve the quality of